All right, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for the Faculty of Education Colloquium Series. My name is Matt Rogers and I am a professor, assistant professor here in the Faculty of Education. Uh, we'd like to begin tonight by recognizing and respectfully acknowledging that this classroom and UNB are located on unsurrendered and unceded traditional lands of the Lusaquay peoples. 
Uh, for those of you joining us from away and in the audience and on the live stream, uh, we welcome you to learn more about this region, its histories, and its peoples. It's my pleasure tonight to introduce you to the newest member of the UNB Faculty of Education, Casey Burkholder. <laughs> tonight, Casey will be discussing her work through a lecture entitled Mobile Makers Exploring Community Issues with Youth Through Cell Phones. Casey will speak for about 30 minutes and then we will have some time for questions from the audience afterwards. Uh, and after our discussions, please join us in the faculty lounge at the end of the hall here on this floor uh, for a small reception and to keep these conversations going. Before we begin, I'd like to provide you with just a little bit more information about Casey and her work. Her research interests include uh, critical teacher education and participatory visual research. She first became in, uh, invested in the relationship uh, between space, belonging, and civic engagement at a young age, growing up in the Northwest Territories. In choosing a research path at the intersection of citizenship, gender, inclusion, DIY, media making, and social studies education, Casey believes her work may contribute to research as intervention through participatory approaches to equity and social change. And now, if you could all please help me in welcoming Casey to the stage. Thank you so much, Matt, and thank you to everyone for being here. Thank you also, Matt, for giving the territorial acknowledgement. Um, so I thought I would begin today by asking sort of a bold question, and the bold question is this. What do we think we know about young people and cell phones? My dad was really nervous that I would be putting people on the spot, and I'm just putting it out there. So think about what it is that you know about young people and cell phones. So one of the stories that's told about young people and cell phones is that young people are so into their cell phones that they are just not even going outside. They're not making relationships with people. They're just sitting at home with their phones. So keep that in mind. That's one story. Another story is that young people are totally addicted to cell phones. Like they can't stop, there's nothing they can do, all they're doing all day is looking at their phones. I think some of you have heard this before. But there's more. Another thing that people are worried about is the danger of young people taking photographs of their naked bodies and sending it around to one another. Young people's sexualities are dangerous, right? And cell phones are in the mix, no good. Another story that I'm sure some people have heard is that young people can't get enough of mobile video, a video on their cell phones. And this is where I see an opportunity. Um, and this is what I'm gonna talk to you about tonight. I'm gonna talk to you about something called cell filming. Uh, so you may be wondering, what is a cell film? A cell film is very simply a mobile technology and filmmaking, the practice of doing that together. It's sort of repurposing what people are already doing with their phones, documenting their everyday lives, through uh, photographs and video, but in this case, it's turning that practice toward um, filmmaking. And so this practice comes originally, um, cell filming comes from South Africa, from media scholars Jonathan Daphne and Kay and Tomaselli. And these folks are working in media, and they take a look at identity and how people in South Africa almost entirely have access to cell phones. So people are watching media every day, consuming media on cell phones, and they thought, how can we reframe this everyday practice and turn it towards media production as well, using the technologies that people are engaging with media on, the cell phone. So why cell film, and why do research with youth? I come to cell filming through the work of Jonathan Daphne and Kay and Tomaselli, also from the work of my supervisor, Claudia Mitchell, who does work with young women in particular in South Africa, and um, teachers too, taking a look at how uh, people can produce media about sexual violence, about gender-based violence, and also about um, HIV AIDS education in South Africa. So these are the places where I learned about cell filming. But I also come to this work from my work as a teacher. So I used to teach in Hong Kong from 2008 to 2010. And when I was in Hong Kong, my students were always filming with their cell phones. They would film things at lunchtime. They would film things um, in the gym. They would film me when I was teaching and I wasn't asking them to film. They would film all the time. But they would also film interactions on the street, like with police officers. So if they felt that someone was being treated inequitably, they would film that. They would document what they were seeing. So this everyday practice of filming is sort of reframed toward a research practice. And why do research with youth? There's tons of work out there about youth. Young people are disengaged. Young people are deviant. 
Young people are troubled. Young people are not interested in citizenship. This work asks young people to become research creators, to work together, to use self-filming, to use the creation of short videos, to answer questions together, to create knowledge about youth with youth. That's the idea. Uh, you may be wondering how do you make a cell film? Well, it's pretty simple, but I thought I would take you through a couple of steps. So this is how I've enacted cell film workshops in my own research. There are multiple ways. Of course, this research is meant to be participatory. So it works with participants to create knowledge. So the way that I do self-filming may be totally different than the way you might want to do self-filming based on your own research population. But bear with me, this is how I've done it. How do you make a cell film? Step one, brainstorming. So when you're brainstorming, it's when you're coming up with a prompt or a question to investigate. You can do this work where you, as the researcher, comes in and has a question in mind to investigate, or you may decide to work with young people themselves to create the prompt. So on the left, or I'm sorry, my left, here we are, uh, what is important to you? This brainstorm came out of a workshop that I gave in Vienna. And I went to the International Visual Sociology Association to give a workshop about cell film methods. I thought I would be presenting this workshop to a bunch of researchers. Um, but when I got to the workshop space, I found out that there were zero researchers there. And instead, I had 20 out-of-school um, Austrian young people. So they were part of a government program that investigated why young people were pushed out of school. And so somehow these people ended up in my workshop. And I thought, the prompt that I had originally planned, which was how do you use, how do you view participation in your research, clearly had to get thrown out the window. And instead, I decided to look at what is important to you, because I had no idea who these young people were or what mattered to them. Um, but what came out of this brainstorming session and the cell phones that came out were issues about financial security, were issues about um, what counts as politeness and how politeness is seen through a cultural lens. Lots of different things came out. Cell filming is adaptable, if nothing else. Um, the second piece is a prompt that I brought into a workshop space about radicalization and uh, extremism in Montreal. And there we were looking at how you can relate to other people, people who are different, religions that are different, and how you can teach young people to accept differences. So these are two examples. Here's another example. Once I was in uh, Lenox Island First Nation, and I was working with a group of six young women, and we were looking at issues of beauty and community on Lenox Island. And so here, you can see notions of beauty, but also community were all sort of erratic and all over the place, which is kind of interesting. So there's no one way to brainstorm, just like there's no one way to cell film. But brainstorming in the way that I do it is step one. Step two is, of course, storyboarding. When you're creating a film, it really helps if you plan out what you're going to shoot before you shoot it because it saves time. So storyboarding is the next step. And just like in brainstorming, there are a bunch of different ways that you can storyboard. In the first image here, this comes from my doctoral research, working with one of my former students. And here we have a person who's writing almost like a comic book. So there's text at the top and an image at the bottom. The next one comes from a workshop that I did in Montreal. And here the person has um, planned out their shots, the dialogue that will accompany the shots, and then they've written the drawings that will accompany those shots. So there's no drawings at all, no pictures at all. They're all different. And um, this one here comes from Lenox Island, and again, it just describes what's going to be shot. So you see things like the beauty of Lenox Island is the title, and then the next piece is about a moving shot of water. So it's really just planning out what the people are going to shoot before they shoot. And this is the politeness film that came out of Vienna. Uh, this one here, the participants spoke uh, mainly German, and so they decided to create a silent film for, I think, my benefit because I didn't speak German, and again, I thought I was speaking to English researchers, but anyway, they created this very interesting film, but even their storyboard was, um, was shown in terms of images. So there's many ways you can storyboard, too. What comes next? Of course, the filming. One of the things that I try to get young people to think about before they begin filming are issues about audience and anonymity. In terms of audience, I try to get young people to think about who they want to share their films with and what they want to communicate. So the way that you might communicate a film about mm, sexual violence to a group of 15-year-old women or young women is totally different than the way you might want to communicate a short film about sexual violence to policymakers or university professors or researchers or your family. 
So thinking about audience is really important in terms of the filming, and that's something that I try to um, make participants aware of. The second piece I mentioned was anonymity. So when people are filming and they're thinking about audiences, another thing they think about is who they want to see these films and for how long and how they want to be shared. And so when I'm asking people to think about anonymity, I say, if you can consent to showing your image, you should have the ability to take that image down. Mm -hmm. So if people don't have the ability to take the image away, I ask them to share things like hands or crowds from a distance or um, other things that are not um, identifiable. So I have a couple of images of filming. Of course, this is me filming. It's hard to have images of filming, and this is another person filming the super moon. Mm -hmm. um, the next piece is editing. Now, editing is useful or not, depending on the context in which you work. Where I have done research before, we use a lot of editing in our cell filming because the media that these young people often consume is heavily edited, like things they see on their Facebook. Lots of different shots, different sorts of images are used. But in my supervisor's work in South Africa, she does one-shot shoots. And in doing one-shot shoots, it means that the entire film is shot in one shot. So it requires a lot of storyboarding, a lot of practicing ahead, because if you don't get it all done in one shot, you have to do it again and again. And again. It's, it just depends on what is useful for your participant. But in mind, we've used editing. So here's an image of two cell phone producers putting dialogue on a cell phone after they've shot it, like narration. And here's an example from Lenox Island where someone's putting a filter on their cell phone to give it a particular view, a particular look. Screening is the next piece in cell filming, and screening is all about showing what you've made to create conversation about whatever issue it is that you're looking at. Um, so here I have my, my cell film screening in Vienna where the young people got together and they talked about what was important to them. And in that work, a couple of things came out. For example, one group decided that they would share their cell film about needing additional financial resources to policymakers within um, Austria. So they made that decision from working together, from talking about what they've seen. And this one here comes from uh, Montreal. And in this workshop, we were creating films about religious extremism <coughs> and the roots of violence, basically. But the audience was expecting films that were about Islam and radicalization of young uh, men in particular. And the films that emerged from the cell film that my group created were all about things like capitalism and patriarchy, and they saw those as the roots of extremism. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was kind of difficult to negotiate with the audience, but exciting in terms of self-filming, in terms of data. Okay, Sharing is the other piece that is uh, worth thinking about in terms of self-filming, and that is who should see this work, why should it be seen, where should it be shown, and for how long. Um, so I call it sharing here. In other places, I call it dissemination. But basically, in this work, you work together with participants to think about who owns the knowledge for how long and where do you want to share it. So sometimes people just want to share their cell phones phone to phone. They want to keep it totally private. Other times, they might want to upload it to a place like YouTube. Um, in terms of archiving or saving those films, um, I'm going to share with you two cell films from three workshops. So that's six in total, if you're doing the math. Um, and they come from these three different public archives that have come out of research that I have done. So one is called We Are Hong Kong 2. That comes from my doctoral work in Hong Kong. The second is from the International Cell Film Festival. You will hear more about this later. But the Cell Film Festival, so the fourth International Cell Film Festival, invited people to submit films about issues of consent. And the third piece is clear, and these are the cell films against radicalization and extremism that we created in Montreal. So here are my three workshops. The first workshop takes place in Hong Kong. The participants for this workshop are 11 ethnic minority young people. It was um, four female students and seven male. I keep calling them students instead of participants because they used to be my secondary school students. So almost a decade ago, I was their teacher. And then fast forward eight years later, they worked together with me in a research project to investigate their schooling in Hong Kong. So these young people were ethnic minorities, but they were schooled in English. They were effectively segregated in their schooling throughout their school lives. So this work, this cell film project, worked with these young people um, coming together to look at issues of identity and belonging. So what does it mean to go to school in a segregated system? How does that shift the way you see yourself? 
and how does that shift the way that you uh, feel you belong in a city? So the prompts, who am I, where do I belong? The first cell film I'm going to show you takes on this question, where do I belong? The second cell film is about the question of who am I? Here we are. My first answer to this question, without a doubt, was home. This is where I grew up, the place that has welcomed me with open arms. Here, a shrink familiarity, acceptance, and the room of support I receive has made it evident that at home is where I am not the most. Truer words were never spoken, and they said, This was like a second home. When made to the space where I feel I belong, is the understanding between us ethnic minorities, a feeling that we have a place, even though we're broken at times, due to our different backgrounds and cultural values. This gives me something in common with them, making it easier to build friendships because of the empathy among us. But it is still inevitable to feel that sometimes I do not belong in Hong Kong. There is an existing language barrier. I do not know how to communicate in Cantonese, and most of the locals do not know how to speak and understand English. This hinders me to socialize in the community, and often I feel rejected and discriminated because I do not comprehend the language. To belong is not an accept and appreciate without fear of being prejudiced. I know that one day, despite my background and my minimal language skills in Cantonese, I will be able to feel that I belong in the city where I am welcome. So one of the things that I learned in that cell phone project is that school was a place where young people built sort of agentic communities, where they built these spaces where they did feel they belong. So in my role as a teacher, as an outsider, I saw it as, I saw schooling for ethnic minorities as completely awful, right? Like totally segregated and not okay. But what I learned in the cell films was that in fact that the students themselves didn't see it as I did, that even though they felt they didn't belong in spaces in the community, in fact, the school was a space where they did feel that they had built real community. So that's something that I, that I learned that I wouldn't have known had I just um, worked in traditional interviewing, which I'd done, for example, in my master's work. So the second film comes from two filmmakers, and this piece takes on the idea of identity. Who am I in Hong Kong, they ask. Who am I in Hong Kong? I am a Hong Kong born Filipino. I was raised in the city. I have studied and worked here. However, I am being labeled as an ethnic minority. Even though I am a Hong Kong resident and have been living there all my life. I try my best to blend in certain Cantonese, yet I still stand out. Because of this, I feel like a foreigner, like I am in isolation. So I involve myself in workshops and community work to feel and be like a local. So in this cell film, the participants are talking about identity and what it means to belong at the same time in Hong Kong. And they note that although they really, um, they cling to the feeling about being an ethnic minority, one place where they feel they do belong is engaging in activism in the city and getting involved in community work. So those are things that I saw in the research that I hadn't seen before. And another piece about cell filming is in this research project, the participants 
uh, co-analyzed this work with me. So I'm not just coming to these um, themes by myself, that we came to it together in watching it together. So the next workshop I'm going to take you through took place in Charlottetown, um, where I taught 18 pre-service social studies teachers. So they were going to teach social studies in secondary school. And the issue that we took on in this work is the issue of consent. Consent as it relates to the body, but also consent as it relates to social studies. And you might be thinking, like, what do you mean consent in social studies? So we were talking about, um, it was the year before Canada 150. So we're talking about stories like the Fathers of Confederation, which sort of doesn't include the experiences of many people who find themselves implicated in Canada today. So for example, Indigenous folks or women, African Canadians, Asian Canadians, working class folks, people who didn't own land. So there's a lot of folks that were not invited to the table, but we're all still implicated in this story. And what does it mean to be a teacher and to teach these stories as our national history if you weren't considered a part of that story, if you didn't consent to them? So I asked them to take on this notion of what is consent? And a couple of different things emerged, but I thought I would share two of the films um, with you today. The first, what is consent? This one's called Capitalism and Consent. on issues that we talk about in the curriculum as far as like talk about capitalism. They're talking about like who really consents and how do we bring up how do we talk about things like land and animals and people and coming together in social studies. And the next one simply called consent. What's one word that comes to mind when you think of consent? Research. Yeah. Approval. Permission. When I think of consent, I think of sexual consent. I think consent is more than permission. That's kind of an attitude or a verbal thing. But if you go along with a group to some place you don't really want to go to, but you're free to go, it's like a behavior too. If you're sad at Think of a time when you had given consent. When somebody wanted to disclose my personal information. I give consent when I have sex. When the feeling's mutual. When have you done something without someone else's consent? Like spreading rumors or stories that somebody told me on somebody else's Twitter. Using someone else's personal belongings to your best. Posting a picture without asking my parents' permission. I see. I took my parents' car without asking. <laughs> okay. So here people are talking about consent and speaking back to consent, but really thinking about it in terms of things that matter to young people. Like what does really consent mean to you? And to me, these are issues that we should be talking in secondary classrooms, social studies and otherwise, particularly in CEI where sexuality education is brought in or not brought in at a teacher's discretion. So 
consent belongs in social studies, but here too. Um, so the final workshop that I'm going to talk to you about happened in Montreal. And here I was working with six graduate students. And as I mentioned before, we were investigating things about extremism, extremism pardon me, and radicalization. And uh, we were looking to our own lived experiences. Like, what does extremism mean to you in your own life? Um, and our goal with the cell films were to create films to be shared in the ethics and religious cultures and social sciences, which is social studies in Quebec classrooms in secondary school. So the idea was that we would create these, these cell films and then share them with teachers who might bring them into their own classrooms and ideally get students to see the films and create films back in response. So we ask, what is extremism? family is situated in a small town in southwest China. Many people know a lot about one-child policy in China, but it's far more complicated than that. You're allowed to have two children if you are an ethnic minority. I'm the second daughter in my family. My mom told me when I was four, my dad even refused to look at me. And it took him two months to accept this fact. And my mom also told me it was that I was lucky because usually the parents will tend will tend to abandon or give away their second daughter. In my hometown, a boy is considered far more important than a girl. Normally, a family with two daughters is considered hopeless. is the person that I love the most in the world. She has always been my role model. She's quiet. She's the person who does all the housework. She taught me how to behave as a good girl. I was taught to be quiet, obedient, and not to expose my body too much. I was taught that girls and women should not sit around the table when it comes to family dinner. These are the principles that she never doubted and I never doubted before I went to university. What she does as a mother is amazing, but I just felt it's not how my life should be. During my college years in Beijing, where it is believed to be the city of highest security standard in China. Sexual harassment can happen everywhere, on a crowded bus, on the street at night, or even a library. Once at night, 10 p.m., I went out alone from a cafe near my campus, approaching my dormitory. I felt someone suddenly put his hands on my back and then my hip. It was a guy who was passing by real fast in a motorbike. And then he disappeared in a second leaving a disgusting smile and an offensive hand gesture to me. I feel really helpless and disgusted. My immediate, my immediate intuition was to fight back, but then my consciousness told me that I was not his opponent physically. I don't know whom to talk to. Should I keep it as a secret? Several news and cases have suggested that if I report this to the police, they will be like ironic, indifferent, or sympathize but helpless. I was really sad and struggled. Okay. So in that cell phone, the girls talked about patriarchy as extremism, and they called on people to share their own stories. The final cell phone I'm going to show you takes on the issue of religious tolerance in uh, Egypt, and it's called the Thin Line. 
can be just a day you need to believe just enough. Just enough. It's like walking on a very thin line in order to be safe. You sure can pray in the mosque, just not too much. You can go to church, but don't ask for new churches even if your population is growing. You're free to practice, just not too much. You cannot not believe, because this is a crime. You can't be a pagan. But who gets to decide what's red and what's green? Aren't we all supposed to feel safe regardless? So, in this cell film, extremism is talked about in relation to religious tolerance. The idea that someone decides what's okay and what's not okay in terms of belief. So, cell films can show us different different things about the ways in which young people see the world. And the other exciting thing about cell films that I think is in terms of project sustainability. Because it's such an everyday practice of documenting what folks are already doing in their own lives, um, there's the opportunities for projects to go on when the researcher leaves the research site. So in my work in Hong Kong, um, the two girls in the two films that I shared with you today have gone on and now they're creating their own cell phone workshops with young women in Hong Kong. And it's called Own Voices, Own Stories. And they're going to be bringing out cell phones in the next couple of months based on their own workshops that they've done. So now I'm gone from the research site and they've totally taken over. So to me, that's kind of exciting in terms of what can happen in participatory visual research. Um, the other thing that we can do is with those archives that I shared with you earlier. So if you have an archive on YouTube, for example, you can see over time who's watching, where are they looking from, how long are they watching for, what are they seeing, are people commenting. So all of this also becomes a site of data, which can be kind of exciting. But I asked you in the beginning today, you know, like, what's going on with young people in cell phones, uh, or cell phones, I should say. <coughs> And now I'm going to say it again. So what can a young person do with a cell phone? They can do a lot. You know, they can document, they can create, they can produce, they can craft, they can share, they can archive, and ultimately they can also resist, which I think is very exciting. Um, and before I say thank you, I want to tell you about something. And that something is this. Uh, on December 7th, here in the Dugal Blue Auditorium, from 5 o'clock until 7 o'clock, we're going to have a cell film festival. So if you'd like to see more of cell films and what can really come out of it, we have a cell film festival called Resisting and Speaking Back that I'm co-organizing with the lovely Sabine Mabel, who's in the audience, um, who is my co collaborator, really, with the Fredericton Feminist Film Collective that we have begun this week. So. <laughs> It's like totally a way to meet friends for sure. um, and collaborators. Um, but the Cell Film Festival is coming up. Thank you all so much for listening and for your, uh, for your concerns. And I look forward to engaging in a dialogue via questions. Does anyone have any questions? Thank you. <laughs>
you've um, a good chance to think about is there any potential therapeutic benefits? Yeah, I don't know much at all about counseling or therapy, but I think it's a really interesting idea as long as young people or whoever was using the, the cell phone had the ability at all times to control who was seeing it and for how long. So if you had it um, where they shared something privately, I think that would be really interesting. I guess in like a group setting, it might be useful. I was thinking even just in terms of creating something. Yeah, for sure. So I mean, if you want to talk more about that, I would be happy. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, it's a very exciting time. Um, we're going to I, I tend to think about the ones that the ones that maybe have very little experience or no experience mm -hmm. with uh, with cell phones for no, any number of reasons and like comments uh, statements like that that uh, everyone in Africa has a cell phone um, where in fact I know that, like here in Canada not everyone has a cell phone right and um, if you want to see mine <laughs> well, to be clear, I said it's South Africa. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. So sure. I think about the ones without, and how they are accommodated in that, uh, in in uh, and within this environment, and made to feel included rather than excluded. Yeah, it's an interesting point. When I've done this kind of work with young people, and I mean like elementary students or people, yeah, I've I've done it up to the storyboarding phase. So let's brainstorm together. Let's imagine what a film could look like. And then from there, you can create something together. So you can have someone who's more knowledgeable about the technology. You could even shoot it with an iPad if that's available in the community. But the idea about self-filming is it really has to come from the community. It's not like uh, other participatory methodologies where the researcher comes in with the technology, does the thing, and takes the technology away and goes. So it's really about working with what communities are already doing. So a cell phone workshop is adaptable and it's about the technology that a community is using. So if someone is not using cell phones, it's not going to be a, a great particular technology, but could you make it with a camera or could you make it with a tablet? Or if those don't work at all, maybe it's not the right method for that space. But it's really about knowing the people with whom you work. Does it make sense for those people? And if it doesn't, not a good methodology, I think. Um. I don't know how to frame this, but you started with a bunch of uh, narratives about kids and, yeah. and cell phones. I want to give you another one. Okay. And, and so part of the purpose of your presentation is to subvert those narratives and tell us that there are other things. Mm -hmm. I have another narrative that I think is equally false, but one we maybe shouldn't subvert. Um, and that is that kids are digital natives and people like me aren't, right? Old, old people aren't. I know Ellen, Ellen has written a lot about this, these narratives about kids. But I think that's part of the power of what you do. So we've looked for a long time for ways to give kids voice, young people voice. But they're always vehicles of which I'm a native and they're not. So the power lies with me in controlling them. One of the potentials here is th this scares me a little bit. I don't feel at home and comfortable with this technology and with this, this way to create a narrative. And that is what helps to transfer the power. I've seen that as a good thing. Mm -hmm. right? So it's giving, it, it, it's giving the younger people power in a way they didn't have before because they're working with a medium at which they are more comfortable than some of the, ad, the older people with that they want to speak to. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes any sense, but I like that. I, I think the narrative is fundamentally flawed, the one about them being digital natives and me not, but it might be a useful fiction. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think <laughs> when people feel that they have control or that they are, they have a skill, it's maybe easier to get their point across. But I, I don't mean to suggest that people who are not young people can't <laughs> do this work. I think it's exciting work. And I know a lot of folks who are doing it maybe with tablets more, with working with yeah. people who are older. But again, if it works for the population, if that's what the folks in that community are using, go for it. For example, my friend Josh Wabkardis does work in Oaxaca on uh, language revitalization, working with elders. And in that work, the elders use cell phones in their everyday lives, or they use um, iPods. And so they've created films to 
reflect and document um, ancestral language and also cultural practices. So that's how it works in that piece. So maybe those films don't look like the films that I showed you, but still they're they're using the people's everyday practices and they're not young people. <laughs> Alice. So I noticed that in all the examples that you shared, they were they were all framed around questions, mm. important questions. And I'm just wondering if that has something to do with the, with the way that you teach uh, cell filming as uh, critical inquiry, if it has mm. something to do with the medium, or if when you give youth voice, that's what happens, they ask questions. Yeah, I think that's an important point. The way that I teach cell filming as a workshop is I often ask people to create films that will get others to think or talk or respond. Because the idea is to create knowledge. And so I think a lot of times that lends itself to questioning. Mm -hmm. So it's not a requirement, but I think that that might be something that I encourage probably yeah. implicitly, if not explicitly. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. I'm wondering about the sharing aspect mm -hmm. that you mentioned and if you've done any research or if you have any information or data about how these cell films are shared. Mm -hmm. And I guess what I'm thinking about partly is um, me not used to looking at cell films. This is, thank you, this is the first time I've seen this. And trying to compare it with other films that I'm familiar with that have higher production values, mm -hmm. right? And so how are these shared? Uh, do people actually, uh, do young people actually watch them, others, or are they, are they more attracted to commercial films? I don't know if I'm asking the right question, yeah. but like, what's the context of how they're actually used and viewed to, you know, share information or knowledge? So it depends on the project, depends on the workshop, and depends on the goals of the project. But in my doctoral work, the piece in Hong Kong, we decided to create a central archive where we all uploaded the films to one space. We all share the password. Mm -hmm. So at any time, they can take them down without my intervention. So that's the equity piece. But who's really watching them? They've been up for two years, and I think the highest views on one video is 500 and something. So people aren't really watching them that much. But people are watching them. How are they being shared? I've shared it in academic conferences. I've shared it in terms of my social network. I shared it with my family, for example. And they've shared it on their social networks and shared it through um, some nonprofit organizations. So that's how we've done the sharing. But it hasn't blown up in any way. But it's interesting. One thing that I've been thinking about as a researcher is what happens when no one is looking? So the idea for this, this method is that you have the opportunity to reach really diverse audiences. But what happens if you're not reaching the audiences? Like, what does that mean? And is that important? That's sort of where my thinking is at. But it depends on how the participants decide they want to share it. Really, to me, it's participant first. And really uh, making sure that everyone is on the same page about who can see it. And knowing that once something's online, like it's online forever. So, yeah. yeah, I have a connected question, which is what happens when the audience becomes the unintended audience? So ethical issues of so the incredible, the incredible films, are, and they're very intimate. And certain issues that these young youth are working through. And so I'm just wondering what happens if fellow students at the school or even one's parents eager to see what you create because um, it's such an important sort of, is it, uh, um, compared to the other uh, research participant participation where you sort of go and you talk to a researcher and it sort of gets written up in results, mm -hmm. there's this real important and maybe valuable product that parents would want to see, et cetera. And so I'm just wondering if you sort of had issues or thought about so what happens when it's an unintended audience yeah. in these films and what can what might come one thing i've thought a lot about is what happens if people are violent toward these online mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. like what happens if people say like forget about you and all people like you in ways like that right yeah. but the really shocking thing to me is that no one has commented on these films yet and i'm waiting and waiting and waiting like why not why not comment I see so much vitriol online, but these films haven't received it yet. Is it because no one's watching? Is it because no one cares? I don't know. Okay. But it's something that I continue to think about. But as a researcher, and I've talked about this with Matt Rogers, right. like, what does that mean? How do you do that work ethically? And how do you negotiate 
the digital world when people are not nice. It's interesting that it hasn't been a problem yet because it was something that was really nervous that would take. Yes. Anticipating the kind of bullying that happens or, mm -hmm. you know, the kind of like opening one's diary to one's parents when you're 14 that yeah. can happen as well. It's sort of, that's really, okay, that's yeah. great. We hear that so far it hasn't been an issue. But I mean, I think that's just because I think it's the critique too, like no one's looking. So what happens if those people look and they can always look later? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not over. This work continues as long as it's up. So it's something that I have to continue thinking about. I've been thinking a lot about this. So you presented to my class last week, and I see all these issues, but I, I the potential I see is the opposite. For I, I, in our, I'm very concerned about our civic discourse, our, our talk together, and and one of the things I'm concerned about is this lack of empathy. So we don't seek to understand others and the, and the positions. And so the power of your work and Matt's work that I've seen is it helps me, it gives me a window into someone else. And if my first reaction is anger or hurt or I feel challenged, but they're not right there. So I think that might soften it a bit in terms of my response. Gives me a chance to think it through and maybe, <coughs> maybe develop some sense of empathy. So the potential I see in this work in a number of ways. So as a teacher, Becoming empathetic, becoming sensitive to, to the so you talk about doing this and then changing your views about well, oh, the school I mean it's not such a bad place to any for these mm -hmm. kids right they don't see it like I see it mm -hmm. you, that, that's the demonstration of empathy trying to see through their eyes that's important for teaching to know where those so I, I see it building there I see it in civic life the potential that well in Hong Kong I mean as, as you know it's a huge issue with with minority groups and now new minority groups are actually ethnically Chinese but they are mainland Chinese right yeah. there's a whole question so and what my observation is people aren't exercising a whole lot of empathy there there's lots of names that get developed and they talked about some of them so I see a huge potential in this I think for fostering empathetic understanding but it is I get the risk but um, anyway but I think in Hong Kong too if this I've asked the participants who they're making the film for, and they say other ethnic minorities. Because if we wanted to talk to Chinese students, we would need some Cantonese in there, right? Like, mm. if that was the audience. But they said it's not the audience. That's not who they want to reach, which I think is interesting. Mm -hmm. Like, why not? But that's not that's not who they decided to uh, do the films for. Although anyone can watch them at any time, so <laughs> maybe people will watch them later. Maybe in 10 years, I'll go back and say, look, I got the vitriol I was anticipating. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not. Yeah. Just a question. You mentioned at the beginning that the uh, process was from brainstorming, mm -hmm. storyboarding, to film, and so on. Um, so if you had a, the, the group to work with, what would be this whole time to start to finish? Because I can picture some you know, people with short attention span, if they want to reach the goal right away, yep. so I have to it totally depends I did one in Alan's class that was an hour and then I've done others that are six months so it really depends on who you're working with what you're looking into how long you have and and how much what your participants want to do yeah does everyone who participates in these uh, workshops feel validated probably not I would say. I mean, the nature of participatory work, I think the critical piece about participatory work is that it's not always so participatory, and often people take charge, and then personality in those groups, you know, like, it's not so equitable. It's often one person does more. So in my work with 11 people, only seven of them created films, four of them only went to the storyboard phase, fine. And then um, of the seven, I'm still working with two, so it's like the nature of participatory work is it's not so equitable. It's like people want to participate until they no longer want to participate. Mm -hmm. That's participatory mm -hmm. research. Mm -hmm. So I think, but do they all feel validated? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I think that they say that they do, but again, it's like power relations. I'm their former teacher. They always say like, it was so nice. We had such a good time. Mm -hmm. But I don't you know, like if that's a performance too, for me, mm -hmm. to make me feel good. So how participatory is it? It's still like, it's, as we talked before, it's less oppressive, but it's still oppressive. Yeah. What I think is really interesting about this, like I'm thinking back when I was in university, they just came out with the internet, and we didn't have
have cell phones or anything like that. Mm -hmm. the, the issues that we got were through media and news mm -hmm. and through um, a filtered views, mm -hmm. let's say. And what I find really interesting about this is that it's not a filtered view. It's, it seems to me to be more um, authentic and a more personal type of um, sharing that people have. And I mean, I'm thinking about what happened in China and stuff like a long time ago and the way that it was. I had no idea, and I was an educated person because I only had what the news showed you. Mm -hmm. Or, and now with this kind of technology, I'm in, in somebody's own school. Mm -hmm. And I can see that, and that's, it's more authentic to me to, than to have something through a filtered um, agency or power, you know. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I just it's really good. It takes I think away that, 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 it takes away that, um, that filter that you may be getting through media. Right. But I think also as a researcher, I'm still filtering. Like if I thought something was problematic or you know, overtly racist, I might be resistant to encourage someone to share it. So I think there's still editing that happens. And also, when participants are creating films for a certain audience, I think they're still doing that editorial work um, because they're deciding what they want to share at that time for a, for a particular group of people. But it is more, it's more individualistic and it feels more intimate for sure. Yeah. yeah. But I think there's also, there's still an editor there. Yeah. Well, there's still like filmmaking techniques as well, right? Like one yeah. of the other audience members talked about the, the how affecting the music was, but that's like the end of like manipulation on the part of the filmmaker. It is manipulation. <laughs> Thank you, audience member. I had told by me. <laughs> a question about um, my field is communications, and there's virtually no theory in that field about the person who actually makes the production, right? It's all about the production and what it does, whether it changes hearts and minds or the process or whatever, but it's not about the person. And you being in education, it's mostly about the person making the production. And I, I guess I'm just wondering, do you see this mostly as an educational theory and approach? Like, is this really rooted in your discipline of education? Or do you see it as having applicability to other disciplines, like communication? Yeah, I see it more like sociology, youth studies. That's where I see it. And education, too, of course. But I, I don't see self-filming as rooted in education. It comes from media studies, and I think it has the capacity to. You saw what they was wondering: Could we do it in counseling? You know, like there's there are opportunities for it to move beyond. But in terms of theorizing, it's very new, so it still needs a lot more, I think, rigor. And I would encourage different disciplines to take it up and practice it and think about what that means. I think that that would be really uh, rich and valuable. Thank you, Debbie. Because I've been a kind of, I work kind of in the area of movie studies, and um, we're talking about it in film. So, as like, so we're not talking about it the way that I feel education is um, in terms of it like a participatory research method, but it's more like people are making films on their cell phones and we're having these screenings. Um, one example is there's a queer film festival in Toronto where there's screenings of films made by people in the community. So I feel like it, it is certainly like wherever media and like film come together, I think it is happening as a practice that maybe a little bit they're start, we're starting to theorize in media studies. Thank you, media studies. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, OK. We have two more. No, no. Well, the one question that I have is about the uh, like following up on the individual that produces it and the questions about learned skills and uh, the experience and that follow like does it lead to further exploration and production of film or um, mm -hmm. like moving into 
using other tools? Like, how does that get? Uh, has that? Have you? Has others written about that or looked at that? Not that I've seen that yet. But I will say, from my eleven participants, one is studying journalism, and she is learning more about traditional filmmaking techniques. I think naturally, as a part of her academic study. But she is one of the ones that's taken on the South filmmaking with young people going forward as a as a workshop facilitator. But I haven't looked at what that means. Like, do people go out and, and continue? I think they continue making films, but I don't know that they continue learning new technology. Something but those like skills, like in terms of the tech, uh, like the steps that you provide and how they can be uh, um, integrated into the work that Matt does and mm -hmm. the work that uh, others do in the media studies and things like that. Um, so you haven't seen, or have you seen any follow up to that? Not on that particular question. But again, it's very new. It could be, it could be explored. That was something to look at for sure. Final question, Mr. Sears, Dr. Sears. Yeah, I think this is a really different approach to research and, and what it does to the whole. Let me try something on you. Um, research is a heavy curate, heavily curated process. Mm -hmm. so you talk about filter and media production, research has all its filters. So by the time it gets to an audience, it's really closely filtered. Are these films research products or are they data? It seems to me they're a little bit of both. They are both. And so what you're doing here is not only inviting your participants in to help you with research, you're inviting me in as a, an, an, a data, to do the data analysis rather than presenting it all as a package. That's right. And that's a, that's a much different thing, I, I think quite interesting thing, but it's, it, it, is that how you understand it? Is that? Absolutely. My horrible thesis has a giant chapter just on process. Just process. It's the biggest thing in the whole thing. It's awful. But I think that just speaks to it. It's the participatory. When you're talking about this work, it's both the product and the process. So the process yeah. is so important. You really have to say, OK, this is what we actually did. So, you know, so when I have data in my work, I tell people how to think about it. Mm -hmm. You at least invite me to think about it on my own. I, I like that. Except so, for the dissertation. So, you know. <laughs> except, I, I like it except for the way that it challenges what I do. But for sure. I'll work it out. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you everyone uh, for coming tonight. Like I said earlier, we have a small reception in the faculty lounge. What is the room number? 225. 225, just at the end of the hall here. So please join us and continue these great conversations. Thanks a lot. And if you're interested in some of our fem Frederick to Feminist Film Collective swag, I have some of the